Assalamu alaikum everyone and a very good afternoon to all of you. My name is Dr. Shafak Sheikh and I work as an assistant professor of medicine at Lyagaj University of Medical and Health Sciences, Jamshoro. And I'm also the joint secretary of PSIM Hyderabad chapter. And I'm truly honored and humbled to be given this opportunity of hosting today's session. So before we begin, on behalf of PSIM, I would like to welcome our honorable chairperson, Professor Farag Zaman, he is currently working as a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist at Hamid Latif Hospital, Lahore. Previously, he has served as principal and dean at Rashid Latif Medical College, Lahore. He has also remained as member executive board and chair audit and finance committee of International Federation of Obsain Gaini and president of Society of Obsain Gaini of Pakistan and of South Asian Federation of Obsain Gaini. So apart from all of these national and international achievements, he was also a part of the team that helped produce the first IVF baby of Pakistan back in 1989. So in short, his profile is everything impressive and we are looking forward to hearing from him later in the day during this program. I would also like to welcome our honorable speakers, Professor Ian Wilkinson and Professor Masood Sadiq. Uh, we would be hearing a lot from them also, so please stay tuned with us. And of course, my warm welcome extends to our respected senior faculty members and you, the attendees. It's the presence of each and every one of you that has led to such a success of this course. So thank you so much for showing so much keen interest uh, and for participation. Uh, so we are going to start off our show. As you know that we have been talking about hypertension for the past eight weeks. Today we are going to do exactly the same. Previously, we have talked about hypertension from different aspects, such as its management and guidelines and classifications and other such things. Today, we are going to take a look at it from a slightly different angle. We will be talking about hypertension in pregnancy, and we'll also be talking about hypertension in children. So I'm not going to give you any further information about these two topics. If you want to find out more, you have to stay till the end of this uh, program. So before we do that, let me just outline some few important points related to today's program. So um, we are going to have two lectures and uh, each lecture is going to last for 25 minutes. And that is something that I would request all of my speakers to please bear in mind because we do have a limitation of time and we do want to end this by 2 p.m. So if you stick to a, a given allotted time of 25 minutes, we'll all really appreciate that. So when the speaker comes on and introduces their topic we will run a pre-test poll and i encourage everybody in the audience to please participate in that because at the end of the lecture we will run a post-test poll as well and we will be comparing the responses obtained from both of these polls and it will be analyzed by our speaker and that is going to be something really interesting so please do participate in that Meanwhile, if you have any questions, please leave them in the Q&A section that you can see at the bottom of your screens. And if you want to leave any comment or if you want to say anything else, please leave that also in the chat box that you can see at the bottom of your screens. Uh, and one request for all the attendees, uh, kindly stick to the topic for today's lecture. Uh, and then our senior faculty members and our speakers will be very happy to answer those questions for you. So now that everything is set and clear, I think we can start off our show with our first lecture, which is going to be on hypertension in pregnancy. And to talk about that, we have Professor Ian Wilkinson. Let me formally introduce him to you guys. He is an honorary consultant physician at Cambridge University Hospital, NHS. He's also the director of the Office of Translational Research and the head of the experimental medicine and immunotherapeutics at the University of Cambridge. His research focuses on biological pathways underlying hypertension and arteriosclerosis with emphasis on basic physiology, experimental and translational medicine and early phase interventional clinical trials. Professor Ian Wilkinson, we are really happy to have you amongst us. So over to you, please introduce your topic and take a brief pause for a few seconds. We are going to run a pre-test poll. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I should say that I'm a practicing physician. I run the hypertension service for the region in, in Cambridge. And I also do a joint clinic with my obstetric colleagues 
looking at women who are pregnant with hypertension, which is what I'm going to be talking about this morning. So thank you for your interest. Okay, so um, sir, would you like to introduce your topic? So I'm talking Please about- share, You can share your slides and then we go off from there. Ah, right. Here we go. Here we go. So I'm gonna talk about hypertension in pregnancy. Okay, great. So uh, we are going to talk about this in a detail. So first we can have the pre-test poll, please. Okay, great. I think that's about it. So you can please resume with your presentation now. Thank you very much. So okay. if you look across the globe at causes of maternal death, you can see that hypertension features highly. It does, however, vary greatly by where you happen to be at that point in time. And this is a completely or largely preventable cause of maternal death. So the fact that women are still dying from hypertension in pregnancy means that we're not being effective in spotting it and treating it. So what do we mean by hypertension in pregnancy? Well, these are purely arbitrary definitions. That's the most important thing to get across to start with. You could make your own up if you wished. However, austere bodies have made them up for us. So generally, we would define hypertension in pregnancy as having a sustained blood pressure greater than or equal to 140-90. And then we subdivide that into chronic hypertension, which means the woman had hypertension before 20 weeks and invariably had hypertension before she became pregnant if those readings are available. Gestational hypertension means hypertension after 20 weeks without any evidence of proteinuria. And preeclampsia is the same, but in the presence of proteinuria. And we can define proteinuria either as two or more uh, ticks on a dip test, or a 24 hour urinary protein creatinine ratio over 300 milligrams per 24 hours. Again, purely arbitrary uh, definitions. So I'm gonna make a couple of points about uh, making these uh, def diagnoses. So first of all, you should use a validated sphygmomanometer. There was a case of a GP in the UK who used an aneroid sphygmomanometer, which are very unreliable. The woman was said to have normal blood pressure, subsequently died of an eclamptic fit, and he was found guilty for not using a reliable sphygmomanometer. So you should use a device which is validated and calibrated if you want to work out whether the woman's hypertensive. From the maternal point of view, the biggest risk from the hypertension is stroke. And the mortality varies greatly by where you live. So in Western countries like the UK, Italy, et cetera, it's probably got a mortality of about two per 100,000 live births. Go to Sub-Saharan Africa, the numbers vary hugely, again, depending where you are. Uh, places like Chad, Sudan, it's probably over 300 per 100,000. So it's common in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, preeclampsia is the condition that most of us uh, worry about and pay most, most attention to. This syndrome often has symptoms, but it doesn't have to. Common symptoms are edema, headache, visual disturbance, often flashing lights or just weird visual perception, abdominal pain, which is generally non-specific, and then we can also get fitting as well. The thing about preeclampsia is the rate of rise of blood pressure is critical for the severity of the symptoms a woman's going to get and risk. And I'll come back to this in a moment, but a lot of women enter pregnancy with relatively low blood pressures. So if you go from, say, a systolic pressure of 90 to a systolic pressure of 150, you can be at severe risk of symptoms and fitting. Whereas if you go slowly from, say, 140 to 170, your risk is somewhat lower. So you need to think about both of those things. And sometimes it's very difficult to differentiate between gestational hypertension and preeclampsia simply on the basis of proteinuria if women had pre-existing proteinuria. So patients with diabetes or chronic renal disease can be very challenging to make the correct diagnosis in. If it's available, P3 
PLGF or platelet-like growth factor can be helpful in ruling out early preeclampsia. And by early, I mean before 34 weeks. It's not helpful later on in pregnancy. But it is an expensive test and we don't even do it all the time in Cambridge. So I've described these syndromes as separate conditions, which is what's shown on the slide here. But it's probably more helpful to think about them as part of a Venn diagram with a degree of overlap, because it is certainly the case that you can have gestational hypertension and then develop preeclampsia. You can have pre-existing hypertension or chronic hypertension, and that can become more severe in pregnancy, or you can get preeclampsia. So it's better to think about them as an overlap condition rather than discrete entities and worry about which of them the woman's got. The other point I'd make to you is that these are arbitrary definitions, okay? So we've all seen plenty of women with very high pressures, 200 over 120, in whom there's not much protein, but we would worry about that woman, particularly from the risk of stroke, and particularly if her pre-existing blood pressure was completely normal. Equally, we've seen women who don't quite make the, the hurdle for being diagnosed as hypertensive, but have a lot of proteinuria on a background of no proteinuria before. So be, be open-minded and don't exclude treating someone or investigating someone or admitting someone simply because they don't reach an arbitrary threshold. Now, I've told you the risk of the woman varies between two and 300 per 100,000 at live birth in terms of mortality, but clearly there's a fetal consequence of having hypertension in pregnancy. And these are some data uh, from Canada, but these are different forms of hypertension, slightly different nomenclature, but let's not worry about that. But you can see the risk of having a, a, a child that's small for gestational age increases dramatically if you develop hypertension, as does the risk of stillbirth, which is what's shown here. So particularly for women who've got chronic hypertension who then develop preeclampsia or get HELP syndrome, that's a substantial two to threefold risk of having a very small baby or the baby dying. Now, I mentioned that <laughs> these definitions are arbitrary, and these are some of the data that would support being a little bit more inclusive in thinking about hypertension in pregnancy. Because if you look at the change in blood pressure across pregnancy with fetal outcome, and here I've just picked birth weight, what you can see here is that those women who get the biggest rise in blood pressure tend to have the smallest babies. So it's probably much more of a continuum of risk from blood pressure than a discrete risk where you're okay to get to a threshold and then it takes off. Comes back to my point about the change in blood pressure being important as well. So when a woman becomes pregnant, a lot of things happen in the cardiovascular system. And some of these are shown on this rather complicated slide here. But what I will point out is that cardiac output goes up by about 50 to 60%. There's an increased flow through the blood vessels and that increases shear stress, which makes more nitric oxide and you get a vasodilatory state. And GFR has to go up because you're filtering not only for yourself, but you're filtering for the fetus as well. And when these things happen as they should, you get a successful pregnancy. But I'll come back later on to what happens when these things don't work as they should. Now, these are some of our own data from a cohort of women we uh, recruited before they became pregnant. And then we uniquely got their blood pressure and various other things before pregnancy and then looked at them in each trimester. And what you'll notice is even by six weeks, which is this point here, there's a significant drop in blood pressure. So when you take your booking blood pressure as you would in the UK, which is done between six and 12 weeks, and you think of that as the pre-pregnancy blood pressure, it's not actually. The pre-pregnancy pressure will have been a little bit higher, about five to 10 millimeters of mercury higher. So this adaptation in pregnancy happens really early on. And it can't be driven by the fetus because, of course, at this point, the fetus is making very little metabolic demand because it's very small. So this is more about a preparation for pregnancy 
and the development of the placenta and fetus. Now, these are very old data, but what you can see here is cardiac output and resistance in the peripheral vasculature in normal pregnancies. So this here's this increase in cardiac output I talked about, and you get a drop in resistance. But in women who get preeclampsia or PET or gestational hypertension, the cardiac output is somewhat higher. And that's sustained throughout pregnancy and gestational hypertension and drops off in preeclampsia. And you can see here the corresponding changes in resistance. You don't need to follow this, but the point is that the hemodynamic adaptation in women who get hypertensive disorders in pregnancy is different. It's not the same as women who develop a normal pregnancy and keep their blood pressure normal throughout pregnancy. These are data uh, from UCL in London. And they looked again at different forms of hypertension. These are women who were normal, gestational hypertension, women who developed preeclampsia late or at term, and women who developed preeclampsia early or preterm. And what you can see here again is that this is different. This is the blood pressure pattern, and this is the ratio of uh, SFLIT to PLGF. Don't need to really focus on that. But what you'll notice is the woman, women with early preeclampsia or early onset preeclampsia have a very high ratio of these two things and their blood pressure goes up accordingly and reaches a peak in early pregnancy. But the sharp eyed amongst you will notice that if you focus on this bit here, these groups are clearly very different early in pregnancy. So you can tell which women are going to run into a problem early in pregnancy. And in this study, the strongest risk factor for getting hypertension in pregnancy was your booking or early pregnancy blood pressure. And if you had a diastolic around 90, you're much more likely to get a problem later in pregnancy. I said to you that the worrying condition uh, is preeclampsia, and that's true. We know it's a problem that you only get in pregnancy. We know the placenta's not functioning properly in preeclampsia. And we know that it's often associated with fetal growth restriction and a small baby, but we do not know what causes it. And part of that is because it seems to be a relatively human specific condition. Animals don't get it. So most of the animal research you read about is not worth re uh, reading because it does not pertain to the human situation. The only known treatment from the condition is to deliver the fetus. And I will point out to you that you can get preeclampsia at the time of delivery and you can get it for a few days afterwards. It's not common, but it does happen. I've seen it myself uh, and you should remember that because don't ignore symptoms and very high blood pressure a day or two after delivery because it could still be preeclampsia. This slide's a bit small and I apologize for that, but you don't need to look at it in detail. These are some of the risk factors for preeclampsia that people have identified. So having chromosomal abnormalities is a very strong risk factor, as is IVF. And then you can go through uh, the slide. Being overweight is a risk factor. Having hypertension before uh, you become pregnant, again, being old or young and your first pregnancy. Again, these are all risk factors for developing preeclampsia. If you look at the risk factors for gestational hypertension, they're pretty similar, to be honest, okay? There are some differences. So smoking, for example, seems to be protective against preeclampsia, doesn't have much effect on the risk of gestational hypertension. And this comes back to my point that there's overlap between these conditions. We can't just think about them in isolation. It's a syndrome and it's a spectrum of disorders. So these are our own guidance uh, in the UK from NICE about how you manage preeclampsia. Now, I'm not saying this is exactly what should happen everywhere in the world because every healthcare system is different. Um, do I think we should admit everyone with mild hypertension? The eye says, yes, I don't. <laughs> What's the point of admitting them if you're not gonna treat them? Because it doesn't say to do anything. It says measure their blood pressure regularly. I think that's probably sensible. And you can do some other tests like kidney function, liver function, 
clotting, etc. The thing about these women is they need a plan. They need to measure their blood pressure regularly. They can do that at home and the midwife can do it, but you need a plan and they need to understand if they get symptoms or the hypertension worsens, they need to seek help. That's the most important thing. Now, we'll come back to this threshold in a minute, but NICE says if you're over 150, 100, treat them. And in the UK, they recommend labetalol. Evidence for that is zero. So it's just a made up opinion and treat them to this target here. Again, we'll come back to that in a minute, measure their blood pressure and again, do some blood tests. And if they've got severe hypertension, basically do the same thing. So if you're over this 150, 100, what we're recommending, at least NICE is recommending, is to admit people and start them on treatment. These are drugs that uh, we could use in pregnancy. And you can see some comments on them and the safety of them. And I'm going to talk about one or two of these in more detail. Drugs I'd avoid in pregnancy, the renin angiotensin system blockers, ACE inhibitors and uh, angiotensin receptor antagonists or the SARTANs. Women who want to get pregnant, I generally take off those drugs. We can have a long debate about whether it's safe to become pregnant on them or not. Uh, but my view is they're best avoided pre-pregnancy and throughout pregnancy. And spironolactone is not a drug we would generally recommend in pregnancy either. So methyl dopa, very old drug, older than me. OK, it's completely safe in pregnancy. It's licensed in the UK. It's been used for many, many years. It's a false transmitter, gets taken up into synaptic vesicles and it is converted into alpha methanoradrenaline, which doesn't agonize the alpha receptor. Actually, it does agonize the alpha-2 receptor, and that receptor is an inhibitory receptor. It should be avoided in women with severe depression or a history of severe depression because it can precipitate quite marked depression. Labetalol. So this is a non-selective adrenoceptor antagonist. It blocks alpha and beta receptors reduces peripheral resistance, has some modest effect on cardiac output. We know it's safe in pregnancy and it's licensed. Be careful in women with asthma because it blocks the beta 2 receptor and do not use it in severe hyperkalemia. I've certainly caused hyperkalemia in women with it. Uh, so you need to be careful. Monitor the K if you're giving big doses, particularly if the renal function is not as it should be. There's Amounting evidence is less effective in people with African or black ancestry, basically. And that doesn't come across in the UK guidelines. It should do. And certainly if you work in areas with a high uh, number of black individuals, you're probably better off with calcium blockade rather than the beta law. Now, nifedipine, you know, this is an L-type calcium blocker reduces resistance and it has little effect on cardiac output. The point I'd make to you is do not use short acting nifedipine. This is a patient I got asked to see and this is her blood pressure. So she starts off about 220. She's given 20 milligrams of short acting nifedipine. Um, within about 20 minutes, you can see a systolic pressure is sitting at about 70. She felt awful, she lost her sight, okay it fortunately came back. This is entirely preventable. The problem in women with severe hypertension with, in pregnancy and without pregnancy is they become very vasoconstricted and they're very dry intravascularly. If you give them short-acting nifedipine, you can cause precipitous falls in blood pressure. Okay, and there are case reports of women dying. I've certainly seen a woman in my own hospital recently who had a watershed infarct or because she had a blood pressure lowered too quickly. Yes, you want to get the blood pressure down, but we do not want to be getting it down to 70 within 20 minutes. In terms of it's safe in pregnancy and it's unlicensed in the UK, but it's very commonly used. Women often complain of a headache. If they can persevere with a drug for two or three days, it often goes away. Okay, and the flushing and edema are related to its mechanism of action, i.e. vasodilatation. We tend to avoid thiazides, and this has got into the ether. 
people worry about oligohydramnios particularly. These are very old data from meta-analysis Rory Collins did in 19, 1980s. And his review showed that they're probably safe. Okay. I don't know why we avoid them. It probably comes from data using very high doses of uh, certain thiazide drugs. I think in some people they are helpful, but you need to be careful in their use and select people carefully. Now, again, a busy table. The detail on the table doesn't matter. I'm simply showing you this to point out that the evidence for all of what I've told you is about zero, okay? There are very few adequately powered randomized controlled trials showing that any of these things work, okay? Certainly the evidence compared to placebo, and you couldn't do a placebo controlled trial now, is that if you give a woman an antihypertensive drug, you lower her blood pressure and you lower the risk of severe hypertension. Well, it says on the front of the box, antihypertensive, so I'd be stunned if they didn't do that. In terms of preventing mortality, we don't have hard evidence they prevent maternal mortality, and we've got virtually no evidence they prevent or do anything to fetal outcomes. In terms of comparing drugs, which is what this bottom thing is about, again, virtually no evidence, and it's probably the case that they're equally effective, but we just don't know. This is one randomized control trial conducted in several countries looking at whether you should aim for a lower target or a higher target. Picked a target of 100 diastolic versus 85 diastolic. Primary outcome of this trial was loss of the baby or the baby needing to go to a high level of neonatal care. Randomized about 500 women to each arm and you don't need to look at the table. Basically the characteristics of the women were pretty similar across the two groups. This is the key outcome slide. Primary outcome, you don't need any stats to tell you it was a negative trial. No difference at all in the instance of primary outcome between the less tight and tight control women. No difference in pregnancy loss either. No difference in perinatal death. Need for high level care. Suggestion perhaps that you get a slightly smaller baby if you lower the blood pressure too much. These were other things they looked at. Higher risk of serious maternal complications in the less tight group, but that was driven almost exclusively by hypertension, basically. And not much difference in everything else either. So this is a negative trial. So if you take the trial at its face value of its primary endpoint, you would say a target of 100 was absolutely acceptable. This slightly smaller birth weight in the women who were aggressively treated down to 85 is borne out in this meta-analysis looking at change in blood pressure and fetal outcomes. And what they showed was that if you drive the pressure down too much, you end up with a smaller baby. So my view is common sense prevails, okay? If you've got a woman who started pregnancy or pre-pregnancy had a blood pressure 90, I do not see the point of driving her down to 85. That seems ludicrous to me. Equally, if you've got a woman who starts uh, pregnancy or pre-pregnancy with a diastolic pressure of 60, yes, you might well choose to aim for 80, 85, 90 rather than 100. But as I said, the evidence doesn't support a target lower than 100. Right. I told you there is no treatment for preeclampsia other than delivering the baby. And even then you can get a problem afterwards. So we do have a preventative treatment, aspirin, and these are those data. Uh, study run out of London. Multi-center trial run in several countries. One and a half thousand women given 150 milligrams of aspirin or placebo a day from early pregnancy, 11 to 14 weeks about 36 weeks and the primary outcome was delivery with preeclampsia before 37 weeks. Now what this trial did is it took women at risk of preeclampsia 
and they worked out the risk using an incredibly complicated algorithm that I'm going to put on this slide here. The point is, it is not fit for anywhere, really. You've got to do all of these things, then you've got to do a complicated calculation and work out the risk. But the trial did show a result in favour of aspirin. There was clear benefit of aspirin in preventing preterm delivery with preeclampsia. These are the uh, key outcomes here. So in terms of preventing preeclampsia for 37 weeks, very effective, okay? In terms of preventing outcomes after 37 weeks did not work, okay? Take home message here is aspirin is effective, but it's effective in preventing preterm preeclampsia. It doesn't really work for uh, late preeclampsia and it doesn't work for non preeclampsia you can see here there were no major adverse outcomes in this study if anything there were fewer stillbirths in the uh, women given aspirin there was no increased risk of misca uh, uh, miscarriage etc so safe treatment dirt cheap generally start it early start it by about 12 weeks and stop it at 36 weeks because it ain't going to help and you don't really want aspirin on board around the time of delivery I will make a couple of comments about this study. Uh, there is something very odd in the trial uh, because they changed their supply of drug as they went on. I don't know what that's about. I told you they used a complicated uh, algorithm to stratify women for high risk of preeclampsia. If you look at the data in the trial, it doesn't seem to do that. So my view is you can use standard criteria like obesity, previous preeclampsia, uh, multi uh, fetus pregnancy, etc, to define your women at higher risk. And the odd thing about the trial is that this is very precise cutoff. It's effective before 37 weeks. It's not effective afterwards, which is what's shown here. And I won't dwell on that. Right, I'm going to spend two minutes uh, just talking to you about uh, something we're particularly interested in and we'll be looking into in, in immense detail shortly in a large uh, cohort study funded by the Wellcome Trust. So if you look at women who've had uh, preeclampsia or, or gestational hypertension, you find they're at very high risk of developing hypertension, about uh, three to four fold risk of developing hypertension in later life. They have about a twofold risk of getting heart disease and about a twofold risk of stroke. Okay, so there is significant risk of long-term cardiovascular problems. And this is shown on this slide here. If you follow women who've had a hypertensive problem in pregnancy and you look at their risk of hypertension, you can see it is much higher than women who have a normal pregnancy and don't get hypertension. It's about threefold, okay, 300% higher. If you look at women who've had two hypertensive pregnancies, then their risk is even higher. Okay, so there is a sort of dose effect. The more hypertensive pregnancies you have, the more likely you are to get long-term hypertension. And then if you look at some other factors as well, there seems to be an interaction between uh, being overweight, i.e. a high BMI, having a high salt intake, not doing much exercise, and having hypertension in pregnancy. So if you do all of those things, have a bad set of cards, so to speak, you have a much higher risk of developing hypertension in future life. Now, a lot of people have suggested that means that preeclampsia and gestational hypertension are causing cardiovascular disease, because that seems obvious from the data I've shown you. <laughs> and there are lots of ways of that might be mitigated, oh, sorry, caused. Uh, might be diabetes, might be hypertension, things like endothelial dysfunction, stiff arteries, etc. But there is an elephant in the room here because these are the risk factors for getting hypertension, okay? Sorry, getting hypertension in pregnancy. Pre-existing hypertension, being overweight. Now, I do not mean to tell you that those things cause cardiovascular disease. So the very risk factors we all recognize for cardiovascular disease are also risk factors for preeclampsia. And if you look at the women who have a hypertension in pregnancy, and you look at their family history, 
you find that, as you might predict, they have a stronger family history of diabetes, of stroke, of myocardial infarction, and indeed of hypertension. So not only do women who get hypertensive disorders in pregnancy have higher blood pressure and are fatter before they get pregnant, they also have a stronger family history of cardiovascular disease. And the Danes <laughs> looked at this question in more detail. And what they found is that if you adjust the risk of a hypertensive disorder in pregnancy for factors before pregnancy, you attenuate that risk. Okay, so you reduce the risk by 60 to 70%. In the case of BMI, you actually completely abolish the risk. So what these data suggest, and I've got a little cartoon here, is that rather than preeclampsia causing cardiovascular disease, it may well be that the risk factors before pregnancy are already there, they cause preeclampsia, but of course they also cause cardiovascular disease. And Naveed Sattar has suggested that what might be happening in these women is that pregnancy is a stress to the cardiovascular system. I showed you the hemodynamic changes in the previous slides where you get an almost doubling of cardiac output, heart rate goes up. And that in women with an unhealthy cardiovascular system, because they've got <laughs> these things here, that further worsens their vascular health and they get hypertension in pregnancy. Whereas in normal women with no risk factors, the vascular health gets a bit worse in pregnancy, but they don't reach a threshold for getting hypertension. And this is something that we're going to look at starting next year. We're going to recruit 2000 women before pregnancy, follow a thousand of those women through pregnancy. And then we're going to look at how hypertension in pregnancy affects them once they finish being pregnant, i.e. post-pregnancy, and adjust that for things we measured pre-pregnancy. And this study, <laughs> the POPPY study, will directly tell us whether things that happen in pregnancy cause long-term problems for women, or whether it's what they were like before pregnancy. And this is a key question because it will help us understand how best to prevent long-term cardiovascular disease in women. And I think I'm going to leave it there, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Wilkinson. It was indeed a very informative presentation and I myself learned a lot from it and I'm sure everyone else agrees with me. And I'm sure there are a lot of questions waiting to be asked, but before we move on to the Q&A section, I'm going to start what we call as a post-test poll. So can we please have those questions? Okay, that's about it. Uh, thank you so much. So while our pre-test and post data, they are being analyzed for comparison, we can start our Q&A section. And now we have... Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions, so we can't take all of them because students, so we will try uh, like to take a couple of questions from our speaker. Kindly raise your hand so we can take you on board. Are there any questions from the attendees? Kindly raise your hand so we can uh, get you on board. Otherwise, we're just going to take questions from the Q&A session. Um, um, may I uh, request Professor, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> Professor Ann Wilkinson, it's uh, extremely exciting and uh, interesting talk. Um, one thing that um, I'd like you to, uh, I've got a, unfortunately, it's for some reason today, I've got a bad internet connection. You mentioned that uh, smoking caused protection, yeah. while in reality, as far as smoking is a major risk factor, as far as the cardiovascular factor is concerned. Yeah. On the other hand, you say that those factors which are cardiovascular risk factors are also the preeclampsia risk factors. So this sounds like a, you know, a reverse kind of situation. So we never encourage women to smoke during pregnancy. And uh, yet over here, as far as preeclampsia is concerned, it's like as if you're saying that those who have it, they may go for a, a bit of uh, whatever they want. Uh, as far as smoking part is concerned. There's another question, but first, would you like to take this thing on? Yeah, How you're do you right. explain this? 
it is a paradox. So women who smoke pre-pregnancy and continue to smoke yeah. in pregnancy have a lower risk of preeclampsia than non-smokers. But but I will make very clear, like you have yourself, that smoking is still bad for the woman, it causes lung cancer, breast cancer, everything else. And long term, it would increase their risk. Why smoking is protective from preeclampsia, we do not know. And people have looked at this for a long time. There are various theories related to the fact that acutely smoking is a vasodilator. Um, it obviously has a lot of uh, substances in it, but we, we just don't know. But, uh, but I, I will make clear that I think women who smoke, who are planning to get pregnant, should stop smoking. It's, it's more healthy for them, even if it yeah, because, reduces... Because now with this new uh, e-cigarette business that is gradually uh, catching up, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, this also has got its own set of problems coming up. While you're flying, they always say no smoking, no e-cigarettes. You know, everywhere yeah. it says no smoking, no e-cigarettes. So yeah, as I'm... far as public health is concerned, another thing is that in our part of, in our part of the world, a lot of these young ladies over here, their resting diastolic blood pressures usually are in seventy range. Yeah. In your talk, basically, you're going around saying that. We, we should aim at 85, 90, et cetera. So I'm getting a bit confused now over here. Um, is it that we should remain as near as possible to their pre-pregnancy or early first term, or first trimester blood pressure analysis? Or you're saying that even 85, 90, don't be worried about it? That's a very interesting question. And we don't know the answer to that question. You you're quite right if you take young women and we've done a lot of this work in cambridge a lot of them will walk around before pregnancy with blood pressures like you know 100 over 70 very common yeah. women have lower blood pressure than men all the time so i think how much your question really is how much can you allow that woman's blood pressure to rise before you intervene I think it would be foolish to try and keep the blood pressure at 70 diastolic. I think there's a lot of evidence that would end up with quite a small baby. Um, the CHIPS trial from Debbie McGee, which I showed you, suggests that you can use a target of 100, and that will be as effective in preventing bad things as a target of 85. Okay. So, you know, my view is the target should be 100. There's no evidence it should be lower, non complete non-evidence based. What, what I was trying to point out is that if you've got a woman who before pregnancy has a diastolic of say 60, and he, within two days her diastolic is 100, that's a very rapid rise, it's a big rise and I probably would treat her. If you've got a woman who starts pregnancy at 90, plenty of those around, yeah. then I'd happily let her blood pressure go up to 100 because I don't see the point of treating 10 millimeter mercury rise. So I think you've got to apply common sense. Um, and that's why guidance is unhelpful. I mean, in my own hospital, we had a maternal death a member of staff who did have a pre pregnancy blood pressure of about 90 over 60. And she fitted with a blood pressure 150 over 100 because she went the pressure rose very rapidly so in your in your setup uh, when a, a lady comes who's in the inner age bracket of 30 and says that now i want to start off with a family um what are your pre basic investigations that you must advise that that's the way you go for it and how do you sort of you know follow it up with this i a woman who is hypertensive um, a 30 year old lady or who hasn't been able to conceive and now wants to conceive. So it may be uh, okay. Professor Farouk doing an artificial insemination over there, etc., yeah. or whatever. So, yeah. my basic thing is that a 30, an elderly lady wanting to get conceived, do we have yeah. any checklist of investigations? Um, in the UK, you just send them off to get pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think if they consult you, be sensible to measure their blood pressure, dip their urine, look at their kidney function. Be, you know, maybe check their antiphospholipids antibodies if they're recurrently miscarrying. Will be sensible. Okay, things right. I think there was a, a good discussion. Yeah. Now, I think our respected Professor Shabazz Qureshi also wants to say something. So please do. 
Thank you very much. I think I just wanted to. You see, if uh, the a pregnant woman is smoking, yeah, she is liable to have a low birth infant. So yeah. I think it is uh, recommended that people, uh, the women, should uh, stop smoking during uh, pregnancy. That is the uh, related to smoking. The second part is that the guidelines actually say that the blood pressure of 140 by 90, even during pregnancy, that is the level for hypertension. And as regards the treatment level, 95. And that have that is why you not bring down the blood pressure to a much lower level than this one. Uh, so that I don't need to actually aggressively lower blood pressure during pregnancy. The, the, my question to Professor Ian is treatment in law as the first line treatment, whereas the recommendations are that it is methyl dopa and labitalol, which also causes a fetal growth restriction, is perhaps the second line treatment as a beta blocker. And atenolol is not considered to be, it is not advisable to give atenolol during uh, pregnancy because that also results in a, 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 a lower weight effect. Uh, so not recommended. It may be possible that if is not available, you can drug it has not been found. Found methyl dopa to stop the Considering the most depression, would you agree? So I'm not. I'm not sure. I caught everything you said. Uh, I don't know. If my it's my connection that's poor. I don't know. Um, so uh, let me just reiterate about smoking. I, I agree entirely. Women should not smoke in pregnancy. I'm simply pointing out the epidemiological evidence that women who do smoke in pregnancy have a lower risk of preeclampsia. That is not to say I would encourage smoking in pregnancy so they should stop, okay? But we cannot deny the epidemiological evidence and it is quite interesting. Targets and thresholds are entirely arbitrary. I've shown you there is no evidence whatsoever to support any of them. And the single randomized trial that was done was negative. Okay, so you can make your own guidelines up and they will be as valid as anyone else's guidelines. Okay. The point about labetalol and methyl dopa, I absolutely agree with you. I showed you what NICE, which is our regulatory body, recommends, and that's labetalol. The evidence for that is about zero. Okay. I grew up using methyl dopa. It's a very effective drug, can cause a bit of sedation, can make some people depressed. It's very rare. I have no problem of using methyl dopa first line. Okay, I think it's perfectly safe. Uh, I will make a comment about labetalol and atenolol and low birth weight. Those data come from a study Peter Rubin did in the 1980s when he was in Nottingham. Uh, and what that study showed was that atenolol was effective, but you ended up with a smaller baby. The average dose of atenolol in that study was 300 milligrams, okay? Now, I don't know about you, but I do not go around prescribing 300 milligrams of atenolol. I'd use 25 or 50. So this is the problem. That a lot of the evidence base that we use is based on outdated uh, doses of drugs, and in some cases, outdated drugs themselves. So I do not think that atenolol in normal doses is harmful, perfectly safe drug, okay? The betalol in normal doses is not harmful. Therefore, I think the choice of drug first line should be left to the clinician. You know, the fedipine, atenolol, methyl dopa are all fine. I'll add one thing of a may, which is one of the questions was about which drugs are not suitable. Amlodipine is not licensed in pregnancy, but it's very widely used in the UK and the States and it's safe. Trouble okay, of it is. Like, no, uh, is it okay if we move to the next question, sure, please? Sure. Because, uh, 
um, one of the attendees, Dr. Muhammad Ahmed, has been waiting to ask a question from you. So we are going to take him on board and he's going to ask you a question really quickly because uh, we have to keep the time limit sure. in mind as well. So Dr. Muhammad Ahmed, please ask your question. Since he is not coming up, we can ask Professor Tariq Vaseem uh, to ask his question. Sure, we can do that. Thank you. Uh, my question was that uh, uh, most of the women, they get pregnant in age bracket of around 25 to 40. And uh, that's uh, after 40, you have increased cardiovascular risk. What I get from this uh, presentation mm -hmm. is that their post-pregnancy risk uh, of having cardiovascular disease is uh, dependent not on the pregnancy-induced hypertension, but pre-pregnancy or uh, their uh, family history. So what's your take on that? Yeah, you're right. It, I mean, everyone likes to believe that the problems in pregnancy cause a long term harm to the woman. The evidence doesn't support that view. I think probably these women were unhealthy, if I can use that term, before they became pregnant, had higher blood pressures, they were heavier, etc. I think the one the one long term risk I am open minded about is renal failure. I didn't show you, but a woman who has preeclampsia has about a six-fold, that's 600% risk of uh, long-term renal disease. And I think if you have heavy proteinuria throughout most of your pregnancy, I'm open-minded that that might directly cause a long-term risk to the woman. But more the opposite for diabetes. I mean, uh, those who have gestational diabetes, they are likely to have diabetes later. Yeah, but and I, I'm, those have yeah. hypertension, they are less likely to have hypertension later. Yeah, I, and I guess if you looked at the women who get gestational diabetes and we're about to do this, you'll find that pre pregnancy they had abnormal glucose tolerance tests to start with. Mm -hmm. The pregnancy mm -hmm. unmasks the problem. I think that's the, that's the way of thinking about it. Yeah. Just a one quick question over here, Professor Wilkinson. You never talked about uh, exercise during pregnancy. <laughs> Could you talk about that? Because there's a lot of trend coming up. Okay, so uh, mm -hmm. Lucilla Poston and people have been quite vocal about this and I've done some studies looking at it. If you can get your women to exercise in pregnancy, you're better than I am. I can't <laughs> get them to exercise, period, let alone in pregnancy. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. But, but, but where do we stand with exercise and uh, exercise and uh, preeclampsia or whatever? Where, where think, do you think about it? Yeah, I think I think I think exercise pre-pregnancy and exercise in pregnancy is a good thing. What I would not suggest is that someone who has done no exercise, who becomes pregnant, starts running marathons. That's not helpful. <laughs> But I and think gentle exercise throughout pregnancy or carrying on your normal exercise in pregnancy is not a bad thing. We, we hear of these Russian studies in which they recommend swimming a lot for these ladies. What, yeah. is, what is your take on it? I think I, I don't, the main thing is to find some of the women like doing. Swimming, cycling, walking, you know, yeah. any exercise I think is better than none. Perfect. I think we can have enough post to uh, comparative analysis. Yeah. Yes, um, the comparison is ready, so we are just going to display it on your screens now. And Professor Wilkinson, you need to comment on these results. Okay, um, so we got a little bit of improvement. The answer is the uh, orange one. It's a normal earlier reading than developing hypertension, hypertensive pressures later on in pregnancy. If you have a high blood pressure at the time of conception, you've got chronic hypertension, basically. Next okay. question. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, my answer would be short acting. Now, fedipine, I showed you, you can kill someone with it. You can give them an infarct, give them a stroke. Amlodipine is safe in pregnancy. Okay. It's used a lot in the UK and the States. And libitol or methyl dopa, at least in the UK, are both licensed in pregnancy as they're safe as well. Uh, it's 300%, threefold risk, that's 300%. 50% is wrong because it's only a 1.5 fold risk. So these women have a huge actually, risk. Actually, the problem this, over here this is, is a little tricky. Yeah. It's a, so it's a, it's a, it's a, percent means three times the risk. 
yeah. yeah. So, so learning yeah. point epidemiologically a... is 300% means a risk ratio of three. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think people have taken it like 50% of those who have developed gestational hypertension, yeah. uh, half of them will continue to have hypertension. Yeah, sure. I think they have taken it that way. Yeah. yeah. Now, you could no, say there's no right answer to this no question. right answer. Yeah. I'm happy that any answer is correct. All right. Yeah, because it, this, this, is a, this is the most tricky part. And uh, uh, we have touched on the diastolic part, but you have not touched on the systolic part either. So if a person has a blood pressure of 150 with an 80, which one is the one to look at? So this becomes tricky. I think the recommendation is uh, 150 by 95, where the blood so, pressure should well, be treated. My, my, my point is that which one would you follow, the systolic or the diastolic? I think both of them. Both of yeah. them should be yeah. followed. No, well, if one target has been achieved, the, systo the diastolic target has been achieved. So do you, I think you, you both. You have to go after. Yes, of course you have to go after both, but if one target has been achieved, so how far can you go for the other target? That's the part. I think we can go, go to the whole common slide now. We can stop yeah, seeing these I mean, questions. I, uh, I thank you so much once again, yeah. Professor Wilkinson, for being with us. And I'm also thankful to all of our senior members who also participated in such a great and wonderful discussion. It was uh, very informating, informative listening to you, but because we are very short on time, so uh, maybe we can continue this some other time. Uh, for now, I would request our Honorable Chairperson, Professor Farooq Zaman, to share his thoughts about the first talk and give his comments as well. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for uh, asking me, first of all, uh, to be part of this uh, uh, really exciting activity, and uh, I would I must compliment Professor Ian Wilkinson for his uh, I would say stimulating and at times provocative talk. Provocative, why I say is uh, because uh, uh, I know that he has uh, original work behind uh, his comments uh, when when he says that uh, the blood pressure should be hundred and uh, 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 that is the diastolic blood pressure that he was uh, saying. He has. Uh, original research behind that. But looking at uh, the guidelines that are available, for example, NICE guidelines, which are followed over here as well, the target blood pressure is generally said to be during pregnancy 130, 135 by 85, 130, 85. That is generally recommended. Uh, my, I would also like to make a comment about his uh, 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 observation that uh, smoking has uh, 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 associated with reduced, uh, that is an observation which was made, uh, but that obviously does not mean that this is to promote smoking in pregnant women because uh, apart from preeclampsia, smoking has adverse effects or many other adverse effects on pregnancy, small for dates, uh, maybe uh, intrauterine growth restriction, and some people would go to the extent of uh, uh, that it causes premature onset of labor, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, it is not good for uh, uh, the lungs also. Other factors which were, are important uh, are to bear in mind are that pregnancy is a, an, a stressful state in itself, and it kind of unmasks the potential of some diseases. For example, gestational diabetes, similarly gestational hypertension. So that is something which uh, uh, shows what is uh, to come downstream after a few years. So in that way, pregnancy is uh, uh, a kind of filtering uh, uh, status at which time one would know or one would uh, kind of uh, see some things happening about which a warning can be given at that time for someone to maintain weight and all that. So from those point of views, uh, I think the talk has been uh, uh, excellent, uh, studied with original work. And uh, I, I would say that uh, it, it generated quite interesting comments from uh, the uh, senior uh, faculty members over here in Pakistan. Uh, once again, I thank uh, uh, Pakistan Society for Internal Medicine for uh, 
arranging this uh, or this series of seminars on hypertension and including hypertension in pregnancy because this is an important, very important topic. Thank you so much, sir. It was an honor and a pleasure to have you amongst us. And thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. We are hoping to see you again in our next programs as well. Uh, so we are moving on with the uh, next lecture of our session today at uh, PSIM. We promise to bring you the best of lectures by the best of presenters. So we are going to keep up uh, with our promise and we are going to present to you a lecture on hypertension in children by Professor Masood Sadiq. Let me introduce him to you formally before we bring him on board. He is the Dean and Head of the Institute of Child Health and the Children's Hospital Lahore. He has received several honors, awards, and gold medals in recognition of his services in the development of pediatrics and pediatric con cardiology, including Tumga Imtiaz by the President of Pakistan himself. His humanitarian services are highly commendable. He's amongst the pioneers of Pakistan Children Heart Foundation. He's also the focal person for international organization called the Chain of Hope. He has been performing surgeries on children internationally and in Pakistan free of charge. It's an honor having Professor Masood Sadiq with us as our next speaker. Sir, over to you. Please introduce your topic and then take a brief pause so we can share our pre-test poll. Over to you, sir. Can you hear us? Yes, some issue has been created. He was here and then he has disappeared. He has had probably some internet connection problems. Yes, I think it's because of the rainy season. A lot of people are having a lot of internet yes. connections, including myself, actually, but I managed anyhow. <laughs> yes. And I think everyone lost out into the internet and they're probably gradually coming back on. And I think Professor yeah. Masood Sadiq Sahib is very much back on. And sir, you're, now we are waiting for you to once again go on slide share and start. And then we'll wait for your... Uh... Masood Sahib, you need to introduce yourself. Uh, you introduce your discussion plan and then we go for our uh, uh, questions. Thank you very much. I, I hope you can hear me now. Uh, the connection was lost for a few seconds. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you and we can, can see you. Can you hear me uh, yes. okay. okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think, um, although this is a society presentation, and I think I um, would have thought that you don't deal with children anymore, but uh, I'm talking about. There is a lot of distortion. I can't hear anything. Uh, I think you can take the time first, and then we move on to. Uh, Sir, Professor uh, Mantri Sadik, there is a bit of a problem with your audio. I think okay. we are all having trouble hearing you. We can't hear you at all. There's a lot of distortion. Uh, you need to do something about your okay, internet. Okay, I can try again. Uh, just a moment. So, so you need to reboot probably. Okay, let me let me try. Okay, okay, I will do that. I think uh, we can uh, run the pre poll first, and meanwhile, Masood Sadek can uh, yeah, run say, adjust. Yes, yes, I think we can do that. Yes, can we please have the pre-test poll? And meanwhile, uh, they settle on. Okay, the pre-poll test is now done, sir. You can please start with your presentation. Uh, I hope you can hear me better now. Uh, am I audible now? It's a bit better okay. than before. Okay. Somewhat better. Okay. Better. But is it still not very clear? Do you want me to start? Because uh, I need to be clear. If I'm not clear, I'm yes, happy to reboot it. Please, please start, please start, sir. Please start. Okay. Uh, hypertension in children, I think the conventional wisdom has been that uh, uh, hypertension in children is, uh, is a very rare thing and it's invariably associated with uh, renal disease. But in reality, primary hypertension in children is now more commonly being diagnosed 
and we shall not miss other causes of secondary hypertension like cooperation of aorta. The typical patient demographic has evolved into an otherwise healthy adolescent with obesity and some combination of cardiovascular risk factors associated with obesity and family history. Uh, historically, um, I think uh, what we are seeing more and more, and I think this uh, current pandemic has actually uh, exaggerated that fact, that children are no more playing in the playgrounds or uh, in their schools. And we're seeing far more obesity in children than we have ever seen before. And this historical Chinese proverb, and case in fact in youth, and case in coffin in middle age, is so true uh, if we come to uh, all the risks of obesity, including hypertension. So I think it's important to know why hypertension is important in children. And I think this concept of tracking where we say that blood pressure trials tend to track from infancy to childhood. And blood pressure in higher times in childhood tends to persist during adulthood. And these uh, adolescents tend to translate into adult hypertension, and children with familial history of hypertension are more likely to track this hypertension. And another important effect about this is low birth weight, which tends to translate to adult hypertension. This relatively old data, but extremely important in terms of prevalence of hypertension in, in children. Uh, Ministry of Health Survey and National Health Survey of Pakistan showed that up to 15% of children under 14 years of age uh, were hypertensive when measured uh, over a period of time. So how do we define hypertension in children? I think the hypertension in the pediatric age group has to be looked at slightly differently because we have these centile charts and those centile charts would depend upon age, sex, and height. And what the current American uh, Association of Pedi American Academy of Pediatrics defines hypertension into three stages. Those who are pre-hypertension, and these are children who are between 90th and 95th centile, or if your blood pressure exceeds 120, 80, even below the 90th centile. And those who are in stage one and stage two, stage one is 95th to 99th centile, plus five millimeters of mercury, and stage two is 99th centile, plus five millimeters of mercury. This cross-sectional data which was collected during National Health Survey, and I said earlier, this is a relatively old data, but this is the most relevant data when it comes to pediatric population in this country. Uh, this was a nationally representative sample of 18,135 uh, individuals from six months to 110 years. And of these, 5,641 were between five and 14 years of age. And two blood pressure measurements were done in the seated position by use of a multi sigma manometer, and this was compared with the uh, with the U.S. data. And what we found was that the blood pressure in our children, both male and female, as well as systolic and diastolic, was higher in Pakistani children as compared to the American group, which was actually uh, same age group. So, how do we define hypertension in children? I think most of you would know that when a baby is born, the blood pressure is normally 60-40. And the average blood pressure in the newborn is 64-41. And it correlates with the gestational age and birth weight. So 95-65 is the 95th centile, and 170 is the 99th centile per newborn. And then the blood pressure rises by 1 millimeters of mercury per day before it reaches to about six weeks of age or six to eight weeks when we take 90 over 55 as a normal range. And then it stabilizes for the next two years. And two years old would have approximately 95 over 58 as, as their blood pressure. And then after that, every year, so you see a rise of one to two millimeters until they're about 12 years of age. And we define hypertension. If the systolic blood pressure is more than 100, into three into age, and that's the easiest way of actually defining hypertension in pediatric age group. And for a diastolic blood pressure, 70 plus 1.5 into age into years, and that actually gives you an approximate or rough idea how do we define hypertension or how do we know in a child whether he's hypertensive or not. So these uh, charts are key, extremely complex, and they're not easy to read, and I think it's not easy for a person sitting in an outpatient clinic 
to go through, uh, through that chart. Now, these simplified uh, tables really give you more than any bigger chart. And I think in terms of age group, we know that as you go older, as I said earlier, your blood pressure rises by about one millimeter of mercury every year after two years of age. So if we remember that, that for a two-year-old, if your blood pressure is above 70 for systolic and above 60 for diastolic, you start evaluation of that child. And obviously, as you grow older, you should add one until they are about 10 years of age. And after that, you can add two for the next couple of years, and then add five to seven for uh, when once they go above 12 years of age. How do we measure? I think another major mistake if we do in pediatric age group is, is the measure. A lot of times I get referrals, and I think most of the other pediatricians uh, get referrals because somebody measures the blood pressure with an adult size dog. You can't do that. That will grossly underestimate. In terms of pediatric age group, we have a neonatal cuff, an infant, small child, bigger child, adolescent, and adult. So there are five to six cuffs available for different age groups. And I think the fundamental concept is that your bladder width should cover approximately 14% of the arm, and your length of the bladder should be covering 80 to 100% of the circumference of arm for it to appropriately or accurately measure blood pressure in children. We don't rely on one or two million. So I think in pediatric age group now, there is more and more emphasis on ambulatory blood pressure million. And we regularly do that in our practice as well, that if you find blood pressure on a higher level on a couple of consecutive occasions or on, on three clinic visits, we tend to put these patients on, on ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. And of course, we all know what are the advantages and what does it add extra in terms of measurement of blood. This is a typical uh, sort of slide or show of a ambulatory hypertension uh, because when the child is asleep, his blood pressure is normal, but as he becomes ambulatory, the blood pressure rises above the 99% limit which we, which we uh, talked about. Similarly, as I said earlier, the cuff size has to correlate with the arm circumference, and that's why we have six different types, including one for the thigh. So newborn, infant, child, or pediatric, a, a young uh, or an average adult, which also covers the adolescent age group, and a larger arm and thigh. And each one of these has to correlate, the cuff size has to correlate with the arm circumference. If you get a heavy child, like a 12 year old who weighs 65 kilograms, of course you can use an adult cuff. And that will be true for age groups, all age groups, depending upon your height and weight. Now, what are the etiological factors in pediatric age group? In pediatrics, we never take hypertension as primary unless we have excluded secondary hypertension. And I think that is the biggest message for today. In any child, if you find persistent hypertension, you must make sure, depending upon the age of the child, and there are three major groups. Of course, one is the renal anomalies, and we see that in infants in pediatric age group, Second is co-optation of aorta, which we exclude at every age. Of course, we know that 40% of co-optation still present after 40 years of age. So co-optation is important at every age group. And then, of course, renal artery stenosis, renal parenchymal disease, few tumors like limb tumors, neuroblastoma, and co-optation stays in every differential diagnosis at all age groups. Of course, in slightly older children, endocrine causes become important. And after 12 years of age, essential hypertension becomes important too. So how do we evaluate these children? Of course, like any other patient, I think your history and physical examination are key. But in pediatric age group, there are certain very important points which you must go to in history. Of course, in your natal history, you need to know whether you had any umbilical catheterization or birth asphyxia. Of course, renal, the most common cause of uh, pediatric uh, hypertension is renal etiology, so you need to go through that. Endocrine, of course, certain drugs are important, and family history of not only essential hypertension, but congenital adrenal hyperplasia, polycystic disease, congenital uh, uh, adrenal hyperplasia, and neurofibromatosis. When it comes to physical examination, we say that there can't be a physical examination unless you feel family positive. And in pediatric age groups, remember, Radio family delay does not occur until 10 years of age because you need to have connective circulation to have a radio family delay. So, what is more important is 
that if you have two limb pulse and lower limb pulse of the same volume or not. And if you're not of the same volume, then you should always think about a partition of aorta as, as a possibility. Of course, all these other, particularly high grade head circumference and your growth pattern is extremely important. Epigastric brewery, your masses, and of course, uh, neurological and fundoscopic examination. The basic workers is no different from adults, but I think in pediatric and so, because we don't assume uh, primary hypertension, we always exclude uh, renal pathology. We always look at, at uh, protein therapy ratio. All patients with hypertension in pediatric age group will get a renal ultrasound, a CBC to make sure that there's no anemia to, to exclude. Uh, of course, CCG and chest x to look for cardiomegaly and an echocardiogram and electrolyte, blood urea, nitrogen, and creatinine. This is a typical echo picture of a patient with prostation of aorta. You can see, you can easily miss them if you're not careful. As you can see in this particular uh, echo color doppler, that prostation is fairly lower down. So you must make sure that you exclude prostation in every patient uh, who gets uh, uh, hypertension in pediatric age. Coming to the treatment strategy, I think there are two major ways where we treat these patients with with secondary hypertension. Of course, interventional treatment is relevant for cooperation of aorta and renal artery stenosis, and surgery in certain patients like renal vascular hypertension, renal segmental hypoplasia, cooperation in selected patients, women's tumor, and theochromocytoma. Now, non-pharmacological treatment is no different in pediatric age group than in adults. Of course, uh, in any child who has a secondary hypertension, weight reduction, regular physical activity. We are seeing more and more children with a sedentary lifestyle. And I think this is extremely worrying uh, because these are the children who are likely to become uh, hypertensive adults. Uh, so dietary medic modifications with low fat diet, low salt diet, family-based interventions. I think what we are more and more focusing in pediatric age group is that you treat that family as a whole. If you ask that particular child to have some physical activity, it's not going to work unless the entire family is involved, and that includes, obviously, uh, parents. Drugs have a relatively limited role in pediatric age group, but of course, in patients who have symptomatic hypertension, secondary hypertension, hypertensive target organ damage, diabetes, or hypertension that persists despite non-pharmacological measures, you, you would, of course, consider pharmacological treatment. I think uh, you are being, uh, most of you would be adult cardiologists or adult physicians, so I don't need to, to teach you in terms of uh, what drug class, how it works, and so on. But I think there are certain peculiarities which pertain to pediatric age group. And I think it's important to know that in which particular condition, which drug is, le is, is preferred. Of course, um, in, in, uh, in terms of ACE inhibitors and you can include receptor blockers, they are the drugs of first choice, particularly in children after five years of age, and the indications are chronic kidney disease, those who have diabetes or congestive heart failure, calcium channel blockers, particularly for patients with post transplantation. Beta blockers are the drug of choice in cooperation of aorta. Of course, potassium sparing diuretics when it comes to hyperendosteronism, and diuretics are normally an add on therapy, and so is vasodilators in, in selected patients. Like adults, we normally form a stepwise approach to this therapy, a lower dose of one drug to be started first, and this is, if it is unsuccessful, we titrate upwards. We normally initiate therapy with either ACE inhibitors or ARBs, rarely with long channel, uh, long acting calcium channel blockers or thyroid diuretics. Calcium channel blockers are contraindicated under one year of age. And similarly, uh, we don't go for ACE inhibitors and ARBs in very young children. Uh, uh, that's where we treat uh, them mostly with beta blockers. And diuretics are useful as an add on therapy. In emergencies, uh, the drug of choice in pediatric age group is either nitroprusside or libitol. Uh, libitol, as most of you know, is, is uh, uh, sometimes not available as an IV infusion, particularly for pediatric age group. We commonly go for nitroprusside as, as the first drug, 0.5 to 1 microgram. Per kilogram per minute, but labitalol along with fusamide, sublingual nephedipine is no longer recommended in pediatric age group because it can cause a precipitous fall, and we have seen uh, very unfortunate happening if somebody has tried nephedipine 
uh, acutely in pediatric age group. The two most common ACE inhibitors which we do use in pediatric age group are captopril, enalapril, and lacinopril. I must admit that the major uh, uh, sort of experience when it comes to pediatric age group lies with captopril followed by enalapril. And of course, um, the patient characteristics where we use them are high plasma, renal activity, renal insufficiency, congestive heart failure, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia. And you can still convert in the only drug which is being used in pediatric case group is lorotoxin. I know that in adult case group, there are many drugs which are being used, but the only drug which has been tried and tested in pediatric age group is lorotoxin. Of course, it's less studied than ACE inhibitors. Uh, dosing is not available in the majority of pediatric and dosing and groups. And in, of course, uh, uh, you must make sure that you check serum protection and serum creatinine. We use a lot of calcium channel blockers in pediatric age group, both uh, mainly and not the And I think uh, it is used uh, when you have uh, underlying conditions like diabetes, hyperlipidemia, peripheral vascular disease. Of course, uh, a certain group of uh, patients who have renal transplant and chronic obstructive disease, which we do see in pediatric age group as well. Beta blockers, uh, uh, the most experienced in pediatric age group is actually propellant. Uh, we rarely use metoprolol or bisoprolol, and the only other drug which we use in pediatric age group is, is etinolol. Uh, of course, those patients who have hyperdynamic circulation, patients with coarctation of aorta, hyperthyroidism, or those who come in with anxiety or migraine, uh, beta blockers are our drugs of uh, first choice. Diuretics are normally, as we know, add on therapy, and we normally tend to add on once we have started with another drug and you want to use a second drug then of course you can use uh, fusamide either alone or in combination with uh, spironolactone or arminoride. Um, we must monitor electrolytes, particularly in pediatric age group when we are using uh, diuretics in this age group. So our patient, uh, as I said earlier, most of the times in pediatric age group, we tend to go for corrective therapy. And if you correct for our patient as a neonate or as an infant, the risk of long-standing hypertension decreases with the age group. The older the child and the peak coarctation, the less likely that you will be able to uh, correct hypertension in the long term. So, neonates and infants is surgery for children over one year and distance native coarctation is balloon angioplasty, and for adolescents and adults, it's stent implantation. Similarly, for renal artery stenosis, uh, we have done balloon and stent implantation in older children, but in younger children, the treatment of choice happens to be surgery. This is a classical patient with coarctation of aorta, where you can see a balloon being inflated across the uh, coarctation, and then post ballooning, you can see uh, a very good result. Um, in discrete coarctation of aorta, uh, balloon dilatation has very good short term, intermediate term, and long term results. When it comes to older children, particularly those who are above 30 kilograms, and where you can actually put in a stent, of course, this day and age, stenting is considered as a superior therapy for coarctation of aorta in both adolescents and adults, as you can see in this particular slide. I would like to conclude by saying that blood pressure should be taken in children at every opportunity, be it physicians or pediatricians' office, school physical examination, siblings of hypertensive parents, low birth weight babies, all teenagers should be screened. And I think there is a case now for a national screening of children with, uh, once they are entering into school uh, to have blood pressure checked at every opportunity. Age adjusted population based BP centiles need to be developed. I think the only centile which we had in this country was the study done in Karachi uh, in the 90s and, and, and early 2000s. And I think that's still the most uh, uh, sort of useful parameter we have uh, at, at the moment. Great caution needs to be exerted before labeling a child hypertension. So I think appropriate cuff, appropriate method, and ambulatory blood pressure measurement is crucial before a child is diagnosed as hypertension, particularly when it comes to primary hypertension. Of course, secondary hypertension, we know the underlying etiology, you must be measure the blood pressure, and you know the child is hypertension. But to label a child as primary hypertension, you need to be extremely careful. The younger the child and more severe the hypertension, more likely is the, is the underlying cause. And of course, the three major etiologies that we need to exclude 
in these patients are renal parenchymal disease, renal vascular disease, and coarctation of aorta. There's no evidence that tracking blood pressure from childhood to adulthood. So if you are a hypertensive adolescent, you are a hypertensive adult. And the treatment must start once you diagnose hypertension as a child. And I think it can cause end organ damage and children develop early cardiovascular sequelae, lifestyle modification, and find family intervention. I think it's important to emphasize that you cannot ask a child to exercise. You have to make it a family event. And if you involve your parents, if you involve your siblings, then the chances of success are much higher. So I think prevention of hypertension should begin early in childhood, and so should be the treatment. Thank you. If there are any questions, I would be more than happy to take the questions. Thank you so much, Professor Masood Sadiq. It was nice having you with us. And hypertension in children is, of course, a very important topic. And it's high time that we talk about it. Uh, before we take any questions or comments, we would like to um, run a post-test poll, please. So can we have the question displayed on the screen? I think uh, one can argue about the answer here because uh, I think majority have gone to, uh, uh, for the... Uh, so we will we'll have we'll have that uh, comparative analysis discussion later on, sir. Okay. Okay. While we uh, wait on for the post uh, test analysis to be go on, sir, President Masood Sadiq, thank you for a lovely discussion. Uh, my basic uh, uh, point for you is that you, in your, one of your slides pointed out that we do not no longer use sublingual nifedipine, and of course that has also got out of fashion as far as adults is concerned. But unfortunately, the use of sublingual caputin Captopril is there, which is as such not recommended. And it's a you break down the tablet into four, and people use a 6.25 sublingual. In all of your slides, you never mention the dosages of any medications to be administered and the, the availability of these medicines for our pediatric patients. Would you like to would you like to shed this uh, any light on this? Uh, Captopril, we actually use very frequently. I mentioned many drugs, but actually, as I said, in pediatric age group, there is very few uh, drugs that we actually clinically use. Tactopin we use as 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram, and we use it entirely. We also use that as sublingually in children as well, uh, but use it as 0.1 milligram per kilogram. I deliberately didn't put the doses here because, because I thought that was not the uh, sort of the uh, that was not required, but if you want, we can certainly share that. But we use it as 0.1 milligram per kilogram sublingually. And when it comes to um, giving them regularly, we tend to give the first dose actually in hospital most of the children because they can drop the blood pressure precipitously. And the dose ranges from 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram. And children tolerate it very well. And the, if you look at the data in literature, the maximum experience in the pediatric age group in terms of uh, anti hypertensive is with capital. Uh, and availability of these medicines. Would you like to talk about that? Yes, uh, yes, they, they are available. Capital is available 12.5 milligrams as uh, caffeine or caffeine. Uh, similarly, propanolol is available 10 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, syrups, unfortunately, are not available in this country. Uh, and that has been a major problem. I've been working on it. We got them immediately for a short period of time. Local company was making it. But unfortunately, the business was so small. Uh, hypertension in children is, is, is not a common problem, uh, or, or not at least clinically recognized. Uh, so they may stop making it. At the moment, we are often uh, crushing these tablets with UP and making uh, either uh, suspensions or uh, putting them in small packets and giving them to the patient. It's not an ideal way, but that's how it is. I know you have done a lot of these coarctations and I've seen you do them. And uh, would you like to uh, uh, tell us something about your own personal data of the coarct, especially the young and the adults, uh, just plain balloon and the follow-up? Uh, we recently actually published our data in catheterization cardiovascular intervention, which is one of the largest uh, series in the literature, where they uh, thoroughly analyzed the coarct in children with hypertension. Um, and uh, what we have shown is that actually stenting is far superior in adolescent than adults when it compares, uh, with, uh, if you look at the, the literature, then it's, it's compared to balloon or surgery. And all the systematic analysis that are being published uh, recently 
do include our study as well, which we published actually in 2014, which was our initial 56 patients on cooperation stenting. And the clear message now is that uh, uh, stenting is the first line treatment in adults and adults when it comes to cooperation. Balloon dilatation is only effective in patients who have discrete isolated cooperation. Uh, and, and that's a very select group because uh, there is elastic recoil and, and you can get a lot of aneurysms in these patients. And some of these patients actually, the, uh, the cooperation is not pliable to them. And you can use that section or aneurysm. And surgery, obviously, for obvious reasons, is not the first choice. You have collateralization, you have aortopathy, and, and, and surgery in an adult is not the choice. So I think stenting is the best option. And I think if, if I remember right, you also looked at the LV and the, the LV hypertrophic, if I remember right? Yes, yes, you are yeah. correct. Actually, we look at the blood pressure as well as at the LV hypertrophic. I think deliberately actually bring that in because that data is on adolescents and adults, not in pediatric age group, uh, on, on cooperation stenting data. And we clearly showed that up to 50% of the patients would actually, you can take them off anti hypertensive treatment, particularly if you sent them as an adolescent. But the data where the age of the child patient was over 30 years, 70% of them were still on anti despite successful cooperation standing. So you actually stop for, uh, further damage to left ventricle and their uh, left ventricle remodels and the left ventricle hypertrophy regresses. But their, their hypertension continues and they remain on anti treatment for almost rest of their life. May I uh, add on, Masood, the most of the adult physicians, uh, when they see patients, uh, the parents are accompanying, the, the children are accompanied by their parents into their office clinic, and they, they do ask about the hypertension. So what do you think, uh, what do you take on, you, you did mention about that it should be taken as a whole family affair rather than a, a isolated hypertension in children. So the, what do you recommend that uh, these patients, majority 7 to 15, 14 years of patient, they do come with mother or father and they are in our uh, chambers. So should they be uh, put on some kind of a screening or anything uh, uh, very I'm, earlier on? I, I'm, I'm, no, I'm a strong advocate of that. I think any child which you see after 12 years of age in your clinic, along with your parents who have strong family, see, you must measure their blood pressure. I think you should offer that to the parents that yes. their blood pressure should be measured uh, because normally these children wouldn't come to pediatrician. Pediatrician yes. tend to see children up to 12, 13, or maybe at the most 15 years of age. Yes. Those who are older children, they, would, uh, they are more likely to be seen by either a GP or a, or a physician. So I think particularly if they are obese, particularly if they are uh, if you have a uh, uh, sort of body mass index, which obviously falls in that category, they must be uh, examined. And Probably this, this can be messy for a time, I think you are likely to achieve more than when they are in their 20s, 30s, or 40s. And second is that, uh, I mean, the data, I, I feel that the, uh, the, the mechanical absolutely. component, vaccination and all that is probably than the renal. So, what do you take on that as well? That the renal component should be investigated more aggressively, or a best uh, lactation component should be. Uh, when think of a secondary hypertension. But that's right. I think. I think if you are under twelve years of age, it depends upon the age group. Those who are under six years of age, I think renal parenchymal disease and, and renal vascular disease are more common. Those who are above six years of age, I think. Then as you grow older, then renal parenchymal disease becomes less important and cooperation and even artist stenosis and other uh, endocrine pathologies become more important. Okay, great. Um, now yeah. we have a, a poll ready. Can I, comparison of can I, yes. can I yes, ask, uh, can I ask sure. Professor Masood sure. Sadiq? Yes, sir, please sure. do. Sure. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Masood, for a very elegant uh, presentation, as always. The, the questions which come into my mind is that the only study which you have rec uh, also referred to was from Karachi, the Metroville study, which showed that if you track the blood pressure, it is a, basically an evolution of blood pressure hypertension which takes place in our children. Now, what is the incidence of obesity plus hypertension or the epidemic of obesity in the children 
is actually also resulting in hypertension. That is question number one. And the second is that in patients uh, who are on antihypertensive treatment, what is the way that you can ensure adherence to your patients? Because these are children and they're going to take it for a long time. Adherence is going to be a problem in them if it is an essential hypertension. And also, what would be the lower limit that you would like to achieve? The, the level that you want said as far as the percentiles are concerned, it's an average of 120 by 80 in, the, in the, these ch children who are less than four, uh, 14 or 16 because then obviously it is 140 by 90. So what would be, is there a low end beyond go with the anti-hypertensive? Uh, so answering your first question, first the incidence of uh, hypertension and obesity in children is about 30%. So those who are obese, uh, uh, the, 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 the data shows that the incidence of hypertension is as high as 30%. We always take these percentile shots in terms of uh, determining what should be the lower level of blood pressure when you are treating these patients. So uh, what we normally do is under two years, any, anything which is less than 100, uh, we take that as uh, acceptable. And as we grow older, as I said earlier, uh, you actually take age in years plus 100 as far as the solid is concerned uh, into three. And then obviously you aim below that. So the aim is always uh, between 50th and 95th centile. Uh, Answering your third question, how do we get actually uh, make sure that they are actually taking medicine? I think you have to convince the parents. Under 20 years of age, it is always parents who would be giving the medicine to the child. The worst period is between 12 and 18. Whatever the uh, treatment is, I think they are the children uh, where they, they, they get resilient. They don't want to take medicine. They would throw away the medicine. They would tell the parents that we are taking it and then they would not be taking it. And they are the most difficult one to make. What we normally do is we would make them friends as you, as you most of you do. And then you ask the parents to supervise them as well. There's no magic actually. Uh, you, you have to see what the family background is, which social class they are coming from, what is the influence of the parents and how, how are they going to take. And then you try and give a medicine which is once a day rather than three times a day so that the parents can give it at the time of their class or at the time of dinner. Uh, so I would be shifting them from capsulin to an allopril because then I know it will be once a day and you can manage that better and so on. And I think that's how, how, how we can see. But you would be needing the uh, uh, the uh, help of the parents more and more in your patients to uh, actually so that they can adhere to the drug. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. That that would be needed. Yes. Uh, we, we don't treat child. We treat the family. I think nutrition is the friend. No, no, you have to involve the parents. Otherwise, uh, uh, it, it doesn't work. If I okay. may ask something, uh, I think before we discuss these, uh, we have a few minutes. Uh, Professor Masood mentioned that the bladder size should circle the 40% of the circumference only, 40%. And he said it very clearly. And uh, while in adults, the weight, the weight should be 40%. The weight should be 40%, but length should be 80% to 100%. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. The all right, all right. All right. Okay, one is weight and one is length. Okay, okay, sure. I take my question back. No, it no, is answered, no. actually. Okay, let's no, I think that that gives clarity, sir. Okay, so we have the comparison of both the uh, polls. Sir, would you like to comment on this? I think uh, uh, our answer was only glucose tolerance session is hard to get the profile. And the, the question has, uh, I think the people have gone away from that and gone for VMA and catecholamine. I think in a 14 year old obese child, his BMI is above 25 and history of headaches for the last six months and his hypertension, this is most likely to be uh, a secondary uh, hypertension, uh, sorry, uh, primary hypertension related to the obesity. And in these patients, the first test we normally do is we want to make sure is, is actually oral glucose or like that. But urine analysis for VMA and calcotolamine is a routine thing which we do in pediatric age group or in this age group anyway. Right, you, you, you are right that we should look at them from metabolic point of view, 
do you go for glucose tolerance test straight away or would you not just like have have fasting sugar? Can we move on to the next? So this is the second question. Would you like to comment on that? Can you hear me? My, my question is that would you not be satisfied with just fasting sugar and fasting lipid profile or would you go for glucose tolerance test straight away? Okay, we'll proceed with the analysis. I think there's some problem with the communication. Uh, sir, Professor Masood Sadiq, are you here with us? Sir, you need to yeah. unmute your mic. Uh, okay, we can hear you now. Okay, thank you. Now, my answer here was actually uh, this is a tool. I think we're having some connectivity issue on his side. Okay, let's see the other questions also, then we conclude. Yes, sir. Uh, since we are having problems on his side, anyone else from the senior faculty, maybe they would want to comment on this? I think in uh, this individual who has a fish in this case, so that is what has happened from the test test now because uh, I lost connection a couple of times. Was I audible now? Uh, no, I, the, the connection was lost. I'm, I'm, uh, I've just uh, been reconnected. Okay, Masood, you can. Is Masood Sadiq to... there? Yes, yes he is back. And I think the because question should be re asked. The connection was lost, but I'm back. Okay. I'm back. We, we can re-ask the questions that were initially. Uh, Aziz Saab, you need to re-ask your questions again. Uh, I, I said it's obese person needs to be evaluated metabolically also. You said lipid profile and glucose tolerance test. Glucose tolerance test is quite cumbersome. And wouldn't you be just happy with fasting sugar as a screening test? I think the connectivity problem is there. Okay. Now let's proceed. And now let's... The See next the question, uh, possibly, I think, Professor Aziz, it, uh, blood sugar fasting could be a, a first alternative to it. Yeah, because in adults we are not doing glucose tolerance yes, very do that, actually, only in pregnancies. Actually, actually, the bigger question is that is HbA1c of any significance? What is your I take think, on that? I think in pediatric age group A1C probably may not because we are not expecting a long-term, long-standing hypertension. Of course, uh, the most question is whether hey, we, are diabetes, of a type, we are talking of a type of diabetes, type 1 diabetic or type 2 diabetic. Because type 1 diabetic maybe have been diagnosed because of DK or anything or right and got it. The question over here is the obese person with, med who, as Zisab is mentioning, metabolic syndrome uh, precursor or metabolic disease. And I think, as is, I, I agree with the Shabazz, that probably as, as a screening, uh, fasting blood glucose would be sufficient to uh, make a diagnosis and probably GTT would be more cumbersome. But would it not be good that let Masood Sadek tell us what, what is their standard practice in uh, pediatric hospital? Right, right. I think he is. We asked him. Actually, the question was asked to him, but he has not. I think he's, there's a connectivity problem because it just appeared on the screen that he has left. No, no, he is someone needs to. He, he, may, may, he may be rejoining, may, but. <laughs> he may rejoin. I'm sorry about this. There's an internet problem. I'm sorry. No, no, I rejoined. I think there's some internet problem. The C3 channel. Can we go to the next question, please? Masood Sahib, what is your standard practice in the pediatric hospital? How do you evaluate? Do you do a fasting blood sugar as the uh, as the way of analysis? Or you do always do a, a whole uh, screening, a GTT over there? No. What is your standard method? Uh, we normally do... Uh, we don't do fasting, but we do... But to make a diagnosis of uh, uh, to, to make a yeah. diagnosis, we actually do go for glucose tolerance in pediatric age group. Nice. Okay. Just as you do in pediatric age group, we also go for 
Can you hear me? I'm not sure if no. you can hear me. No, the, 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 the connection on me? your side is not, not very, uh, say, I think, stable at the moment. So we do we have a partial answer. But oh, you, you, you okay. do stay with us and okay. let's uh, us try you answering your show. questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we, we can. Okay, okay. Okay, if we add a group, we actually do go for glucose tolerance test to make a diagnosis. Otherwise, you do a random blood sugar as you do in, in pregnancy. Uh, but I know in adults, you have many other ways of, you can do a fasting blood sugar, you, you have many other ways of finding that out. But in pediatric age group, that is still the standard. Right. Okay. So can you comment on the rest of the poll questions as well? Yes. Responses. Yeah. Can can go on to the second show one by one. On the Bring it back. To the second question, please. It. Yes. Okay, for question two, I think the majority has picked up uh, correctly. Uh, of course, if it's a 14 year old boy who is coming with uh, hypertension and CBC is showing severe anemia and blood gases are showing metabolic acidosis, it's an underlying renal problem. Uh, so, renal function test on the left to right, which is renal failure, typical renal failure in a 14 year old. I know, but I Renal function. <laughs> Renal function and the natural life will be the most likely. Next. I think I know. I don't know. A two-year-old girl with Caucasian with known skin are ready. I think the answer was... Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. The detached hair is skin allergies because this child is presenting with clear respiratory distress and silent chest for two days. And this child was started on his So the correct answer here was exacerbation of asthma and not heart failure secondary to heart failure. So the correct answer was exacerbation of asthma. Can Edmund unmute rest of the people because we are having distortion? Yes. So the correct answer here is exacerbation of asthma because this child had a sea of skin allergy and had a silent chest on arrival and was put on and drawers. So I think uh, the detect answer was exaggeration of asthma and not heart failure secondary to constitution. Next. Now we don't go into heart failure at two years of age with prostration of aorta. The, the age that you go in heart failure with prostration is either as an infant or later on in age. Right. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes. Can I go on to the next? Yes. Uh, 10 year old with the facial swelling, fetal edema, ultrasound, small fluid effusion. Uh, urine shows numerous RBCs and protein urea. Now, the condition which we say we see in pediatric age group with hypertension is actually acute glomerular nephrosis. Mm -hmm. Necrotic syndrome is less likely to be associated with hypertension. Rather, the differentiating point between nephritic and necrotic syndrome is often uh, this differentiation. So, if you see a significantly high blood pressure, it sits nephritis uh, rather than necrotic syndrome. So the correct answer here was acute glomerulus. Right. Okay. Can we move on to the next one? I think this that, was the last question of the okay. poll. So we can ask the chair to conclude. Shafak. Uh, yes, sir. I think uh, Professor Farag Zaman has left. So okay. I would uh, like to uh, thank everyone, myself, unless somebody else from the senior faculty wants to comment. We, will, we request Professor Azizu Rahman, Professor Azizu Rahman, or Professor and Professor Shabazz. In fact, Professor Shabazz has a hand raised and probably he wants to say something. Also. No, no, I, I, I already, I, I think so, I should So then you need to lower your arm. <laughs> You, you, have the, you have the option of lowering your hand also. I think once you raise, yes. and then... Oh, okay. <laughs> I think let, let's... Shafak, I let think me... I think Zisab is the appropriate to conclude it. Who? Sir, please do. Sir. You, sir. Okay, Azizab. I think it was, it was a wonderful session, two different topics, and we learned a lot of things uh, about hypertension and pregnancy. Uh, though there were some points, there was some controversy between the chair and the presenter, 
But you know, our science is full of controversy. There are most of our science is gray, very little is black or white, but there was very good discussion. And in the second session, of course, the presentation was absolutely great. And Professor Masood Sadiq is a great orator, very good teacher, but there was some problem with the, I think, not on the internet, but the audio quality was also slightly compromised. My IT department asked me if we could request him to remove his this head uh, uh, the headwear, but I did not want to dis uh, disturb him. But we were, with some consultation, we were able to get all the points he made. So I'd like to thank all the, the speakers and the chair and the, our ever-present panelists, Professor Bilal Mohideen and Professor Shabazz Krashi and Professor Tarek Masim. Somia was uh, busy somewhere. I think she should. Uh, she did show some presence somewhere. I think if she is here, she may contribute. She's, she's probably organizing on to the, the conference. Uh, she is very busy. Because, in other words. Right. So uh, I, I, at the end, I must compliment and congratulate our today's uh, moderator. A very, very good emerging talent. Shafak, thank you so much. Very good. Well, very well done. We're proud of thank you. you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank and you we so always much. thank our supporter, the pharma corporate members, uh, and uh, this Kashif, not only supporting us financially, logistically, but he's always present in the meeting also. Thank you very much. And so we and always have a message for the upcoming conference, sir. So you have to give that message as and, well. And then well, next we, PSIM <laughs> is holding a, a hybrid conference in Islamabad. We will be staying in Serena, but the meeting will be in Marriott because we could not get hauled in the this Serena. It is on 30th, 31st of July and 1st of uh, August. August. The member registration is open. You can contact any member of the PSIM or any pharma partner. So you please get registered and be there. Those of you who want to participate but cannot come in person, this will be broadcasted online also, so you can join online also. Everybody is welcome in our upcoming meeting. Hypertension. Next Sunday. That is that is not uh, hypertension. That is uh, the whole internal medicine. And next Sunday we also have a session. So, uske baare mein. Chef, you have the program. Uh, yes, sir, I do. So on next Sunday, we will be talking about the effects of hypertension on two very important organs, the brain and the eye. So I hope everybody joins us next Sunday as well. Don't miss out because that is going to be pretty interesting as well. And thank you so much, sir, Professor Azizur Rahman. You're like the backbone of this course. Um, so thank you so much. And of course, the pharmaceutical company, uh, they have been going strong. And of course, all of the senior faculty members as well. And we hope to see you all again next week. I'd rather say the Atco Pharmaceutical Company. Yes, definitely. <laughs> let's let's take the full name out over here. And Shafak, by and by, may I compliment you? I, I thought this was an eighteen-year-old little girl sitting over here. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So I got two compliments in one day. I'm good at moderation, and I look like an eighteen-year-old. Thank you. Mashallah. And keep it Thank that you. way. And Masood Sahib, as always, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. I really find this is. Because of the quality of sound and the interruptions we had, but that's made better. Sir, but I presume pediatric people, are, pediatrics are always frustrated for one reason or the other. I think it is uh, that this uh, <laughs> has a patent Bluetooth mic. Is that right? Okay. Yes. So uh, that is yes, probably that, not that was clear. the problem. Hmm. So, so if you use the ordinary uh, routine mic, it would have been probably better because this the Bluetooth get distorted by other electronic equipments going around. Okay. But, but of course, we learned a lot. We, we did learn a lot. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a nice day. See you next Sunday. Allah Hafiz.